get into the message uh, on a personal note. Um, I was in the car earlier this week, and uh, and when I was as I was driving, I said, "You know, Lord, I'm." I said, "For the last month or so, I said, just my service for you has just been empty. It just it's been joyless, you know, and and." Uh, I just, and I, later in the day, I, I was listening to a, a, a message by a guy, and he was talking about the Apostle Paul, and uh, specifically Philippians, and we've been through Philippians here, and it's called the Epistle of Joy, and you remember where Paul was when he was writing it? Yeah, his fourth year of prison writing the epistle of joy, waiting for Nero to decide if he's going to cut his, you know, lop his head off or, or not. But it's the epistle of joy. And I, I just, I said, Lord, all the things, all the things, the things I, I'm, I'm doing, the service that I have that I'm doing for you, everything seems real heavy in a bad way, not in a good way. And I realized that I've allowed certain things to just rob my joy in the service. And, you know, you understand, guys, joy is not so much found in an event, in the serving. There is that to an extent, yes. But joy, peace, rest, contentment is found in the person of Christ, right? And the Lord just, and I begin to realize how much I complain. And I've done a lot of spiritual warfare teaching in the past. You know one of the top five aspects of strongholds in a person's life? is complaining. And I just said, Lord, man. And, and here's something, a little aside. Guys, we need to be careful that we don't misconstrue God's patience with us. For his acceptance of our sin. Yes, God is patient, absolutely. But he doesn't accept. Jesus hung naked on a cross and was slaughtered on a cross for my sin. And I just, I just said in the car, I said, Lord, I just confessed my sin. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm just, you know, coming out of Egypt. I'm the, I'm the person, I'm, the, I'm coming out of Egypt. Say, hey God, I'm tired of these uh, chicken breasts. Can you send a bacon wrap filet down? <laughs> right? You know? And so, it kind of ties in a little bit with, with what I'm talking about, about the de just the devastation of drought. And I just wanted to share that with you. Remember to pray for these two guys. Okay? Remember to pray for, you, for your leadership here. Because there's times that it, it, it gets dry. You say, oh, you, it gets dry serving the Lord? Absolutely. Because sometimes our hearts get dry. It does. So thank you for allowing me to share that. I was going to share it whether you allowed it or not. But um, I want to talk to you out of Jeremiah chapter 14. If you've got your Bible, I want to talk to you about the devastation of the drought and if, when you look at the verses at the beginning of the chapter, there's a, literally a, a drought that's happening. And I'm just going to read a couple of verses from Jeremiah 14. It says, This is the word of the Lord to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Judah mourns, her cities languish. They wail for the land. And a cry goes up from Jerusalem, the nobles and their servants for water. They go to the cisterns but find no water. And it, just, and it goes on that way. Now, under, remember, who are we talking about here? These are not the Moabites, the Hittites, the, one of the ites. Who are we talking about here? Who, Jackie? The Israelites, which are who? God's chosen people. Before we get into what we're talking about, remember, these are God's chosen people. All right? And down in verse... 10 is where I want to start because this drought 
There's a physical drought, which is so, just simply symbolic of what? The spiritual drought that we're getting ready to look at. And when there's a spiritual drought, folks, there's manifestations of that drought in a person's life. And that's what I want to look at in verses 10 through 22. But there's always, God always provides the opportunity to say, for you to say, Lord, here I am. As I did in the car earlier this week, saying, God, man, my heart, I'm serving, but my heart feels far from me. Remember what Jesus said? Your lips say one thing, but your heart is far from me. I was speaking at Clemson's FCA, one awesome time we had for 20 years speaking to their FCA up there. We're having an incredible time of ministry. And we're on the stage. A young man walks up on the stage and one of the leaders. And he says, and he get, grabs the microphone. He says, guys, and there, there's, there's about 1,500 kids in, in, those, in, in that Tillman Auditorium there. And he says, um, I was at a, a party the other night. And uh, a girl comes up to me and she recognized me. She'd been to our FCA meetings every now and then, once in a blue moon. And she said, I know you are one of the leaders in FCA. She says, I, I need to ask you something. She said, I see people who go to the FCA all the time and they uh, do the same things I do that aren't godly. They get drunk like I do. They go to the same parties that I do. And, and y'all, I'm telling you, 1,500 people, you could have heard a pin drop. And then she says this. And, and the guy said, with all sincerity, with all the sincerity, this young girl said to me, he said, she said, they do all these things. And they say that they're Christians. And she said this to him. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. We're going to look at some points of what it looks like to be, to experience drought in our hearts. One of the things God taught me in my first cancer, Foster, I want your heart. I want your heart. So I ask you this morning, does God really have your heart? Let's look, at, let's look at this. Let's look at what a spiritual drought looks like. Now remember, these are God's people. This is not just anybody we're talking about here. Verse 10. This is what the Lord says about this people. Here's the first point. They greatly love to wander. They do not restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. Here's the first point. That someone who's experiencing spiritual drought lacks restraint in their lives. There's a recklessness in, of heart and mind and inner, inner being. Inner being. And here's the thing. Internal fullness always results in external expression. Whatever you're full of, the scripture says, out of the mouth comes what? The issues of the heart. Whatever is inside of you, whatever is inside Brian, I can stand next to Brian for a minute or two and know what's important to him. Now notice what it said there. It says, their, their feet greatly love to wander. There's two things there. Greatly and love. It doesn't just say they, love, they, they wander. It says they greatly love to wander. They love what they're doing. And it's magnanimous. It's not just a little bit. They greatly love what they're doing. They do not restrain their feet, so the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. Here's the thing. This is the southern kingdom, the, the Judeans. And folks, here's the thing about them. They didn't think God was going to do anything. Jesus into my life he'll forgive me oh really well I, I, I prayed that prayer oh really what prayer was that and there's a recklessness here 
See, the, the Judeans think, didn't think God was going to punish them, but, but, and for the reason, they didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They were so far, there was such a barrenness in their soul, in their hearts, they didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They greatly loved to wonder. Folks, you ever find, find yourself getting reckless really quick in your heart? I mean, it may not be so much external. It, may, it could just be your thought life. Secret places of your heart. More so than anything. And that's going to come out eventually. Ju the Judeans greatly love to wonder. Do you? Do you? First point. Is that the Judeans lacked restraint. Here's the second thing. Verses 11 and 12. Then the Lord said to me, talk to Jeremiah, do not, listen to, what, look, listen, listen to what God says, do not pray for the well-being of this people. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, famine, and plague. Here's a second point about this drought. The spiritual drought of the soul. Is that their life, their, their life with God had become very, and I'm going to say this from a negative connotation, had become very religious. The word religion is not a bad word, but in this context, it's very bad. Their life had become very religious. In other words, there was simply outward, man, there was just an outward focus and outward observance without the inward transformation of character. There was a checklist thing going on here. Okay, I read my Bible today. Okay, I prayed today. Okay, I went to church once a month. And there was this checklist kind of thing. And guys, that's the way I was. I can remember sitting in seminary studying to be spiritual. And Laura would come in, I'm, I'm having my quiet time. Laura would come in, and I, literally, she'd try to ask me something. Can't you see I'm having my quiet time? <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Close my Bible and say, God, I'll see you this time tomorrow. I've done my duty to God and my country. I'll see you this time tomorrow. Your lips say one thing, but your heart is far from me. These people here, guys. Now notice, notice what they're doing here. What does it say they're doing? What are their actions? Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings. What do you see them doing? What do you see them doing? Yeah. What do you, what, Ryan, what do you see them doing there? Going through the motions. Going through the motions, Ryan? What else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not bad things, right? These aren't bad things. And God says, Jeremiah, don't even pray for these people. Don't even pray for them. And guys, that's the, that's the third time he says that. He said it in chapter 7, he said it in chapter 11. Don't even pray for these people because their hearts are so far from me. But yet, we see them doing all these religious things, Robert. All the right things, Cindy. All the right things. But yet, their heart is greatly wandering and is drifted. And there's, there's not a desire of, of repentance. Remember us talking about this? There's not a repentant heart. Oh, I, I, I'll just ask God to forgive me. 
I'll live recklessly and just say, oh God, forgive me. Oh, really? Well, Catherine, at least my Bible says in, in John, 1 John chapter 3, that if I can practice sin, that I don't know God. If I could just go out and live this reckless life, then I really don't know God. I don't care what I've prayed, but I don't know God. And there's no, you don't, what we don't see here, you guys, what we don't see is any real repentance. We have a lot of activity. Like in, our, in some of, a lot of our churches in North America, folks, we've got a lot of activity. We've got a lot of polish, but we don't have any power. I had an old school, I had an old school rocking horse with the springs on it. Remember those? Yeah. And when I was a little kid, I'd get on there with my hat. And back in the day, you had cloth diapers and my cowboy boots. And I'd get on there with my cowboy hat and my diaper and my cowboy boots. And, and baby, I'm riding that thing. <laughs> I'm killing it. Just like that. And, and man, I was wearing it out. But I never went anywhere. A lot of movement, a lot of motion, a lot of activity, but I never got anywhere. And folks, a lot of our churches, we've got all this external activity, a lot of polish, but there's no power. Why? Because we're focusing on the wrong thing. We're not focusing right here, here, but we're focusing on all the activity. And we're missing what God has. All these, these people here, oh, we'll just do the external, the external stuff. And, it'll, and God will love it. He'll love it. We become satisfied and content with the external duties without, without the internal dying to self. Let me tell you, self, dying to self, and I'm not going to get into this, dying to self is way different than self-denial. Dying to self, what the scripture encourages, is way different than self-denial. Any athlete knows about self-denial. There's certain things you can and cannot do in order to perform at a maximum level. Dying to self is way different. The Spirit, dying to self, is when the Spirit, Robert, grabs our will. That's what he wants, G Jenny. He wants your will. That's where the dying to self occurs. The will. And those three words that he wants to hear, Ryan, from us. Here I am. Jesus said them. Elijah said them. Moses said it. Here I am. In other words... I'm, I'm yours. All of me. Every bit of me. And I'm not going to live this, this, uh, this external focused life. But I want the power to come from the Spirit. Not, not the checklist. And there's no power in that anyway. T.S. Eliot calls the greatest sin... To do the right thing for the wrong reason. The people of God here, you guys, were very religious and they're missing God. They're missing Him. Here's the third thing. Verses 13 through 16. Matt hit on this earlier. But I said, Ah, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling him, Jeremiah talking, you will not see the sword or suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I've not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. 
They're prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they're saying, no sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by the sword and famine, and the people they are prophesying to will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. There will be no one to bury them or their wives, their sons or their daughters. I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. The third aspect of this destruction of drought in our soul is that this group, the people of God, followed false teachings and they believed lies. How do we know we're following false teachings? Josh, Josh sent this to, to uh, Matt and I, and you, you hit on it a week ago. And here's, here's uh, some of it. Here's how we know we're following false teachers. Among evangelicals, people who say they're Christians, they believe in God. 31% say science disproves the Bible. 62% say God accepts all religions. 62% say the Holy Spirit is the force. Are you kidding me? Now guys, this is among evangelicals. Evangel... I'm going to start throwing stuff. 66% say people are good by nature. I'm not born in sin nature. 75% say God first created Jesus. This, does this sound familiar? This is among the people of God. 75% say God first created Jesus. Are you kidding me? How do you know the truth? Jesus said the truth will set you free. I was talking to a young man in our church. He said, Foster, and he asked me a, some, he asked me a particular question. And I said, bro, let me just tell you. And I shared with him, and part of what I share with him is, is knowing the truth from the Word. And you know what he said? It got real quiet on the other end. He goes, and I could hear the tone of his voice. He goes, dang it. I knew you were going to tell me that. He said, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. You know what I found in my life? When I'm not in His Word, when I'm not fellowshipping, when I'm not fellowshipping with my Heavenly Father, I get angry at my wife easily. Things stir up in me that I thought were gone a long time ago. Things just bubble up and just boom! It's right there. Like that time I was fixing the toilet. <laughs> and it was not good. I actually scared my wife. I mean, stuff just came out of me. Just came out of me. That hadn't come out of me in years. These people here, and guys, I'm going to tell you something. Be careful. Talk about false teachers. Matt, hit on You better be careful who you watch and listen to today. This prosperity gospel stuff will take you away from God and will take you away from Jesus. You hear what I'm saying to you? Be careful who you listen to. It's not true teaching. It's not biblical and it's not biblical history. If God wanted us all to be healthy and, and not be sick, then we'd all be healthy and not be sick. And our Savior died on a cross. All the guys followed him were martyred. What about them? False teaching. These people followed false teaching. They believed lies. And it's important you know this truth or you're going you're gonna to drift. Hebrews 2, 1 and 2. You're going to drift. It's always a slow burn away from God.
and you're going to believe lies, especially about who you are in Christ. Well, you need to grow this out. You need to shrink this up. You need to look better. You need to act this way. You need to do this. And you're going to believe lies because you don't know truth from the Scripture about who you are in Christ. These people, all they did because they didn't know and they didn't follow the one true God, they believed lies. And they didn't know what the truth was. Folks, do you know why most people don't read their Bibles, tell others about Jesus, and pray? Because it's a spiritual battle. When you walk out of here, this is not a playground out here, it's a battleground. And it is a spiritual battle. That's why most people don't do that. Most Christians never tell anybody about Jesus. And guys, I know, I'm not, I'm not trying to just hammer on you, okay? But I'm saying, we are in dire straits as the, as the people of God, just like this group is here that we're looking at. In North America, the body of Christ is in dire straits. And we are experiencing a drought, I believe. Young lady, awesome gal, loved Christ, was at the University of Virginia at the time. She said this, God's really been showing me his, his grace this week and invited me into his rest. Praise him. He also dealt with me a lot uh, that weekend. This is the weekend uh, that we had some ministry up there at, at the University of Virginia. And this week, to expose how much Satan lies... I found myself really feeling defeated by sin, like we talked about, and feeling unaccepted by God and men. Satan was trying to get my focus off of Christ by tempting me to compare myself, and she mentioned some of her friends. He was telling me, you're not pretty, you're not spiritual like, like the others, and because of that, you'll never get married. And she's now married and has two or three or four or 15 kids, I forget how many, she's got a bunch. When I got back to UVA, I just released everything in tears and talked with my roommate. But praise God that those lies were exposed. He helped me replace those lies with God's truths about me and to learn about his grace and unconditional love. He was trying to show me, I think, that my spiritual walk and life plans are unique and it is futile to compare myself with my friends. You believe in lies this morning? Some of us are. Some of us are. They be, these, peaks, these people here believed lies. Oh, God's not going to do anything. You're fine. You're fine. And then finally, finally, verses 17 and 19. Speak this word to them. Let my eyes overflow with tears night and day without ceasing. For my virgin daughter, my people, has suffered a grievous wound, a crushing blow. I go into the country. I see the slain by the sword. I go into the city. I see the ravages of famine. Both prophet and priest have gone to a land they know not. Have you rejected Judah completely? Do you despise Zion? Why have you afflicted us so that we cannot be healed? We hope for peace, but no good has come. For a time of healing, but there is only terror. Last point when there's a spiritual drought is that great, dis great, great distress grips your heart as a result of the drought. Great distress grips your heart. Anxiety, anxiousness, fear, when we are living in spiritual doubt, I got up one night, it's been eight months ago, and uh, using the bathroom, and uh, as I was going back to bed, y'all, you know, my body just started just con convulsing. And um, I was like, man, I'm not sick. I don't know what's going on. I'm not sick. And everything just started shaking. And I got in the bed and, and, and lay down and, and Laura woke up. And she said, you okay? I said, no. I said, I think I'm under attack. And Laura started praying and singing. 
and and I mean nothing happened. I was just in the bed, and I mean literally, I was sh I was jackhammering in the bed, just just, just shaking. This is Jeremiah, Lord. We acknowledge our wickedness and the guilt of our fathers. We have sinned against you. First thing, we recognize and acknowledge our sin. Now, notice what Jeremiah does here. Notice what he, how he says it. He doesn't say them, does he? What, is he what, what word does he use? Twice. Say it, Daniel. We. He includes himself in with, this, with the people of God. We. We. Acknowledge and recognize our sins. It's a Daniel 9. Daniel 9 prayer. God, we've sinned against you. We've sinned against you. And I, you know, I can remember sitting in, in a Sunday school classroom and, and this, this lady was teaching and just doing a beautiful job and, and she was talking about these kinds of things and I... And, and I, I don't know if I was being judgmental or what, but, I, you know, people were just sitting in there and, and just kind of picking at their clothes and, and just, just this nonchalant. And she was just bringing and talking about our sin. And, and, and I wanted to, God, y'all, I wanted to get up and just run into the middle of everybody and just go, ah! And say, what's wrong? We need to wake up! Wake up! Wake up! And I'm talking to myself. Wake up. And it starts right here in verse 20. The acknowledgement and recognition that God, we're, we're, we've sinned. We've turned our back on you. And, I, and as a result, we've turned our back on the, peop, on the people we come in contact. When you go to work tomorrow, you're not going to work to make money. You're going to work to infect the area where you work with the gospel. God will provide the money. You're going to work to worship tomorrow. To worship tomorrow. And to build bridges with people that don't know Christ. That's why you're going. And our buddy, our buddy uh, Randy Davis, talking to him the other night, they're just, God's using them in their neighborhood at his job. Uh, the Davises used to be in church with us. And he's using them in that area in Utah where they live. But it starts right here. This, this healing from this spiritual drought, folks, starts right here in verse 20. Father, I've sinned. And guys, in just a minute, I'm going to give us an opportunity to maybe come and confess or sit in your seat and confess or get on your knees in your seat and confess. I'm going to give you that opportunity. And if you do it sitting right there, then you do it sitting right there. That's fine. But this is where it starts. This is where the, uh, the road to living water starts to move away from the drought. Acknowledge and confession of our sin. That's the first thing. Second thing. Verse 21. Now notice, guys, when we read verse 21, notice how theocentric this prayer is. In other words, notice how God-centered this prayer is. Verse 21. For the sake of your name, do not despise us. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Your name, your throne. Remember your covenant with us and do not break it. Here's the second aspect of this living water that we need. Remember His greatness. Remember God's greatness. His throne, which was the symbolic of God's presence with them. His throne. Recognize, acknowledge my sin. Remember God's greatness. Jeremiah 32, 17, verse 27. I am the Lord God. Is anything too difficult for me? I am the Lord God. Is anything too difficult for me?
can't talk and cry. One of the greatest things, when I think about that, was almost... almost <laughs> Almost a year ago, this coming September 23rd, it'd be a year September 23rd, sitting in the den and hearing that young man right there say, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. I am the Lord God. Is anything too difficult for me? Whew. All the years we talked and talked and talked, and I'm thinking, dang it, God. Dad, come. <laughs> Save him. Come on. And then he says, Lord, I surrender. Folks, remember His greatness. Let's remember His greatness. And then finally, finally, verse 22, Do any of the worthless idols of the nations bring rain? Do the skies themselves send down showers? No. It's you, O Lord, our God. Therefore, our hope is in you, for you are the one who does all this. Last thing in receiving this living water is to reach to the source. Recognize, acknowledge our sin, remember His greatness, and then finally reach to the source. Remember what He told the woman at the well? John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. He told her, He said, If you keep coming here to this well, you're going to get thirsty again. And obviously, He's talking about a soul thirst. You keep coming here, you're going to get thirsty again. But he said, verse 14, If you will come to me, I will satisfy the thirst of your soul. And not only will I satisfy that thirst of your soul, but springs of living water will begin to flow out of you. It's twofold. I will satisfy, and it will flow out of you. Remember, internal fullness always results in what? External expression. Internal fullness of the Spirit, external expression. I thought verse 14 was a lie. For a long time. You know why? You know why, Charles? Because I got thirsty again. I got thirsty again. Because it says I won't get thirsty and I got thirsty again, Blake. I got thirsty again. I wanted this over here that was not of God. I got thirsty, Tim. And this says I won't get thirsty. And as I was in Pennsylvania preaching, I went into the pastor's office, there was a devotion sitting right there, and I just opened it up, and it opened up to John chapter 4, verse 14. And it said, this means it's not that you won't get thirsty again, but what it does mean is that when you do get thirsty, that the Spirit of God will satisfy the thirstiness of your soul again, and again, and again, and again. That's what it means. And y'all, he says, reach to the source. And here's the sad thing. As far as we know, the people in, this, in the southern kingdom of Judah, in Jeremiah's ministry, the majority of these people, the majority of them, never repented. They never turned back to God. Ever. And he says right here, verse 20, 21 and 22, come to me, reach to me. I'm the, so I'm, I'm the living water that you're looking for. To satisfy the drought of your soul. So I close. We're done. How about you this morning? Let's bow our heads.